People all over the world today are living in fear. Some people are scared to death. And the thing about fear is it's contagious. But so is faith. And so is love. And so is hope. Those of you that are part of Grace, we know that the church, it's not a building. We don't go to church. We are the church. The church is happening every day, all the time, in, in homes, in, in restaurants, in, in work environments. We are the church. And the message that we carry, the good news about Jesus Christ, it's really what everyone is looking for. It's the message that the world is desirous to hear. Join us this coming Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection, as we open our hearts to the power and the transformative ability of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, today is Palm Sunday, as my wife mentioned, but it's also Soap Sunday. Soap stands for Scripture, Observation, Application, Prayer. It's a way of processing in our own devotional prayer time as we spend time in the Word. God will invariably quicken or, or stir up a, a verse or two. Uh, as you're reading, especially if you're reading and you're saying, God, speak to me. God, I open my heart to you. I want to hear what you're saying. Speak into my life. And, and God is so faithful to do that. And unfortunately, we, we, we live such busy lives sometimes that that may happen in our devotional time. And we'll think, wow, I'm going to have to look at that verse again. But then we get caught up in the busyness of life and the busyness of the day. This is a, a choice to very intentionally take a moment and say, okay, I'm going to write out this verse of scripture that you spoke to me about. I don't know exactly what you're saying here, but I think you want me to spend a little more time on it. And so, Lord, I, I'm going to just uh, prayerfully uh, ask you to give me, you, allow me to see what you're saying here. And, and, and as you observe those things, you, you write them down. And then, and then as you're praying into it, you say, okay, God, how do I apply that? How does, how does this affect how I live from now on? What, what's, what's, what, is, what changes? What, what becomes different? And then ultimately turning it all into a prayer that basically you're saying, Lord, help me to do this. Help me to put this into practice in my life. And so I, I uh, you know, we instituted this, I don't know how many years ago. We were in the old building. You know, and uh, we just, you know, we just tried having a soap Sunday, and it went so well that we have not stopped. And I don't know that we will. We might stop after the, after the rapture. I don't know. We'll, we'll see what happens in heaven. But does anybody have a soap that they would like to share today to edify the rest of the body of Christ? Come on. You don't have to tug on Lachelle much. She's, she comes fully equipped and with bullets in, in both guns. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> um, so my main uh, verse here is Colossians 3, 23 to 24. But it did lead me to two other verses. Um, so those are in Matthew, so I'll share all three of those. Um, so Colossians says, Work willingly at whatever you do, as though you are working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward, and that the master you are serving is Christ. Um, and then the other one was Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, people, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, for I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Um, oh, I forgot to say my soap's about purpose. So, um, And then the last one was Matthew 22, 37 through 40. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second commandment is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. My observation is that purpose isn't out there waiting for me to find it. God already gave it to me. He created me in his image with good works <clears throat> to do and special gifts to use. Those gifts are not for my glory, they're for his glory, so that I can be a part in revealing God to the world by using my gifts to serve those around me. Purpose is about stepping into the person that God created me to be not about pursuing my passion or my dream job. It's truly about seeking him and making him known to those around me to go and make disciples by loving God and loving people. My application is um, that anything I do, I'll do with excellence to the best of my ability, knowing I'm doing it for God and not for man. My purpose is to love God and love people, and there is pure freedom in that because I can do that wherever I am. I will trust God and continue to do the next right thing because following Jesus gives me the best purpose I could ever dream of or imagine. Um, the next right thing has been a big deal for me because sometimes I get overwhelmed with all the things that I need to do and I need to do them well. So sometimes just focusing on the next right thing and then after I'm done with that, I'll focus on the other next right thing. <laughs> um, so my prayer is, Lord, Thank you for creating me with a divine purpose. Help me live out that purpose today and every day that you bless me with on this earth. Wherever I am, whoever I am with, help me love others the way that you love them. Help me see them through your eyes. Help me show others of your love by the way that I live my life today and every day. Reveal to me what my next right step is. Lead me and guide me as I go through my day my life and each of those who I encounter along the way. And when I don't know what to do next, help me fully trust in you and follow you in all things. In Jesus' name. Amen. No problem. Amen. I'm encouraged already. I guess I'm going to stop looking for my dream job. Settle into what God has called me to do. Who else would like to share a soap? Come on, Dave. Yeah, you actually, yeah, that's true. You can sense that soap anointing, just kind of. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Okay. Uh, Scripture, and I titled this Length of Days with Tranquility. Proverbs 3, 1 through 2. And this is out of the Amplified. My son, forget not my law or teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of a life worth living and tranquility inward and outward and continuing through old age till death these shall they add observation what have i forgotten what am i missing application can i draw my life today into peace can peace and tranquility coexist in me We're looking forward to hearing everybody's answers after this. I'm giving you bad time. <laughs> okay, prayer. Jesus, you ask each of us to not forget your words and our direction. Your words tie us together. Your words embrace our actions, good or bad. Your words define us. 
Your definition is for our good. Jesus, what is the value of tranquility in our lives? Do we have tranquility from our knowledge of you or our own tranquility of ignoring your word and our realities? We can be deniers of our own experiences. Our turmoil can be our history. Jesus' life has its own tri uh, turmoils, but you have mine. I changed, and the blood washed me clean. My self-defense is resident between me and turmoil. Jesus, allow us all to take up residency with you in the shelter of your wings. Comfort us from turmoil. Comfort us from ourselves. Let us experience your tranquility. Lord Jesus, come into me and my life. You know all about that. I want to change from what I've done and experienced. I need your presence to do that. I ask for your help. Amen. Yep. Amen. Tranquility, the peace of God that passes understanding. Who else would like to share a soap? See, my daughter walking this way, it's either to tell me to do something with this. <laughs> I've been, how, many, how many times have you been off camera today? Ha <clears throat> <laughs> um, ha. So I've been reading through the Bible chronologically, which has been really interesting. I've never done that before. And um, so obviously I started at the beginning in Genesis. So these were just a few things um, that God highlighted to me um, because it happened more than once. And I always, when something happens more than once in the Bible, I always take note. So I've got um, two scriptures, um, Genesis 20, 17, and then actually goes through Genesis 21 through verse 3 says, then Abraham prayed to God. Oh, let me, I'll give you backstory here in a minute. I'll just read the scriptures, then I'll give you some backstory. I actually wrote this out. This time's the first time this has ever happened. Let's, whoa, <laughs> be afraid. Okay, it says, then Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his female slaves, so they could have children again. For the Lord had kept all the women in Abimelech's household from conceiving because of Abraham's wife, Sarah. And then Genesis 21, it says, Now the Lord was gracious. This is the next verse. The Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in, in his old age at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. Uh, my next verse is Job 42, 8 through 10. So now take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and sacrifice a burnt offering for yourselves. My servant Job will pray for you and I will accept his prayer and not deal with you according to your folly. You have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Nemethite, just pretend those are correct, did what the Lord told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. Next verse. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. Let me give you a little bit of backstory and a little bit of my observation of that backstory. So Abraham had been promised a multitude of descendants, but is currently childless. He keeps lying about he and his wife. This is not the first time this has happened. <laughs> about their relationship, and he keeps finding himself in hot water because of this. So, but the Lord is faithful to him, and he, he has him to do something very interesting. I feel is very interesting. He has him pray for the barren wombs, because he's closed the wombs of the king's wives. Okay, right? So, um, can you imagine Abraham's thought process during this time? Oh, sure, God, I'm going to pray for these people's barrenness, I can't even have one kid. Yeah, sure, that sounds super fun. Let's do it. Um, maybe this wasn't his thought process at all. These are just things that I imagine that could happen if I was in this position. Um, but he was obedient, 
and he prayed. It didn't say he fought, he argued with God about this or anything. He did it. And the next verse in the Bible is, says that God was gracious to Sarah and fulfilled his promise. So he prayed for something that he did not have himself for someone else. The next moment, he has it. Okay. So now Job, he's had super rough go. Uh, he has been defeated in every area of his life. And now when the Lord finally starts talking to God, after he's been silent for a really long time, um, and he explains to Job, he starts off with Job about his unfathomable greatness, the awesomeness of God. And at the end of this, he said how his friends were totally wrong, but he asked, uh, but the Lord asked Job to pray for them. Now, these guys were not very nice to Job. I don't know if I would have felt like praying for them. I'd be like, yeah, I'll pray for them. <laughs> you might not like how I pray. No. I'm, so I'm just saying, like, think about this realistically. These people have been super mean to you, and God's like, pray for them. Bless them. Um, so they, so he, he did. He was obedient, and he prayed over them. And the very next verse, it says, the Lord restored everything Job had lost and more. So again, He's praying for him, trying to bless his friends when he has absolutely nothing. He has been defeated in every area of his life. And the next verse, he gets it back. So my, the whole main observations out of this are um, God had people pray for things that they themselves did not possess. Things that they had been promised. Things that they wanted there is a blessing in praying for others, specifically over things that we do not have. Um, God had Abraham and Job pray for people that they may not necessarily wanted to pray over. <laughs> so these may not even be people you want to pray for. Um, it took trust and it took discipline in the Lord. They had to have that relationship with the Lord first to be able to do this with the right spirit. And so... Um, God asked them to do these things that were uncomfortable. They were emotionally messy. It wasn't exciting. It wasn't probably what any of us would be looking for in this circumstance. So my application, is there opportunity for me to grow in faith and discipline? Am I listening or am I missing opportunities, opportunities to feel uncomfortable Am I missing opportunities to grow my discipline? And am I missing more of God's provision in my life because I'm busy doing my own thing? Not that my own thing is bad, but am I missing some opportunities that the Lord is putting at my feet? So am I willing to do the hard things, the things that don't make sense to me? I don't think it would make sense for me necessarily to, to pray over these different situations but am I willing to be uncomfortable? And, and am I willing to be disciplined, even when it doesn't make sense? So my prayer, <clears throat> dear Jesus, help me not to lean on my own understandings. As I listen to you to seek and step out to do your will and to do exactly what you ask when you ask, may my obedience beat out my doubt and my uncomfortableness every time. May I see your blessing as I choose to focus on you and what you say is important. Give me opportunity to pray over others and walk in faith at all times. I give you the glory every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow. You know, James said, uh, pray for one another that you may be healed. Isn't that interesting? Who else has a soap to share? Come. Vain. Mm -hmm. Oh, good morning. I'm in Colossians 2, starting with 8 through 15. Um, been kind of personally meditating on the transition I'm in, and one of the things the Lord said to me with my transition to retirement is, you need to focus again on the kingdom of God first. 
and his righteousness, and all things will be added to you. And then right after that, he says, I want you to go back and ask God to uh, reactivate all your former anointings, and then we're going to add to it. Um, part of when dad passed away, went, went to heaven, and then my own uh, medical things kind of put myself on the back burner, not necessarily that God did, but I stepped back, and there's, there's a necessity for grieving and things like that. Well, he's reactivating. <laughs> Here we are. Part of the transition is step back into what you were called to do. So starting with verse 8, and I'm uh, in the Passion uh, Translation, uh, one thing that came up this week is I'm being set up to lead some people to the Lord. So I had to go do a review here. Um, it says, beware that no one distracts you or intimidates you in their attempt to lead you away from Christ's fullness by pretending to be full of wisdom when they're filled with endless arguments of human logic. For they operate in humanistic and clouded judgments based on the mindset of this world system and not of the anointed truths of the anointed one, our dear Christ. Uh, well, we're getting an eyeful of the fruit of what that's going on. <laughs> you know, if you're listening to worldly, ungodly things. Verse 9 says, He is the complete fullness of deity living in human form. And our own completeness is now found in him. We are completely filled with God as Christ's fullness overflows within us. And he is the head of every kingdom and authority in the universe. Now, I don't know about you, but that really comforts me. Uh, I'm going to try to move this without losing it. Sorry about that. Through our union with him, we are experienced, we have experienced circumcision of the heart. All of the guilt and power of sin has been cut away and is extinct because of what Christ, the anointed one, has accomplished for us. For we have been buried with him into his death. Our baptism into death also means we were raised with him when we believed in God's resurrection power, the power that raised him from death's realm. This realm of death describes our former state, for we were held in sin's grasp, but now we have been resurrected out of that realm of death, never to return. For we are forever alive and forgiven for all our sins. Well, there's good news for you. He canceled out every legal violation we had on our record and the old arrest warrant that stood in to indict us. He erased it all, our sins, our stained soul. He deleted it all, and they cannot be retrieved. Everything we once were in Adam has been placed onto his cross and nailed permanently there as a public display of cancellation. Then Jesus made a public spectacle of all the powers and principalities of darkness, stripping away from them every weapon and all their spiritual authority and power to accuse us. And by the power of the cross, Jesus led them round as prisoners in a procession of triumph, and he was not their prisoner, they were his. Now, that's some good news right there. And so as we're reviewing that, sometimes you've got to review, especially if you've been in the faith for a long time. You need to go back. You need to go back and see what he really did. And uh, it encourages me that he bought and paid for everything. Everything he did to said paid in full. And then you turn around and say, now, what's your position in that when you've Ask Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So I've been observing that. He did it all. He did everything. We died with him when we asked him to be our Lord and Savior. We were, if we did everything well, we were baptized in the water, and that just washed away all the old stuff. And then we're raised in fullness with him. And he made a public spectacle of the enemy on our behalf. And so uh, everything that we've ever done, um, sinful and, and evil and ugly, has been washed away. And even if we do it again, we go back and humble ourselves to, to our precious God and say, will you forgive me? I've done it. I've sinned against you. Will you forgive me and cleanse me? So how I'm app applying this um, 
One of the new things I'm doing with my prayer life is I'm taking scripture and I'm turning it into prayer. So, f um, for example, like verse 11, I, I turn that around and say, Lord Jesus, thank you. Through our union with you, we've experienced uh, circumcision of heart. I thank you that all the guilt and power of sin has been cut away and now is extinct because of what Christ has done. And, and I just go through scripture like that, and I pray it back to him. Because we're seeding the atmosphere with the truth. And I want to do that, and I want it to be deep down in my heart. I want it to change me. The word of God just by itself will change me. So that, that's um, my application. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I thank you that when we make you Lord and, and Savior of our life, we get to be declared free from sin. You just wash that away. It's not existing anymore. If we went back to look for it, you go, what, what are you looking for? That's gone. And we are resurrected into new life and new power. It's not by our strength. It's not by our will. It's not by our abilities that we are made whole. But you have made us whole by filling us with your spirit. And we thank you for that. If we ever need help, you are very good. You are very just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from our unrighteousness and give us everything we need to, to raise up and be mature ourselves, and to minister to other people that are looking for you. So I'm excited, Lord God. Everything that is facing us, you have got a plan. And nothing shall separate us from you. And you've got this, Lord God. So I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Come on. Thank you. All right, I have two verses today. Um, that my soap is based on. The first one is Isaiah 61.1 1, um, in the New King James Version. And the second one is actually more of the application section. It's kind of answering it. And that's Ephesians 3.16-19 through 19 in the New Living Translation. Okay. So Isaiah 61.1 1 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. We know that this was originally um, given to Jesus as a fulfillment of that scripture, that that was his mission, right, when he was uh, walking on the earth during his ministry. But then he turned around and gave that mission to us, and he gave us the authority back that we had lost, and he told us to go and do likewise. And so as his body, he is our head, but as, as the body, it's our job to continue this on. So my observation is that it's very difficult to help other people get free of what you yourself are struggling with. It doesn't mean that you can't help in some way, but it's very difficult to help people break through issues like what Pastor Dave was saying about fear or whatever that might be if you yourself are entangled with fear. And so many times the Lord will have us on a journey of teaching us how to be free and healed, how um, he wants our part, the parts of our heart that are imprisoned to things. He wants to show us how to get free of those things. And then we can take our knowledge and our experience and then help others get free. My application then is to my, my second verse, which is the Ephesians 3, 16 through 19. And it says, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down <clears throat> into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. 
Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. And so my, my application is I believe that a lot of times when we have a part of ourselves that's locked down to fear or whatever it might be, there's often an either a situation where we've been hurt and our life experiences seem to go against God's promises. And so we struggle with fully trusting in God's promises. Or there's an embedded lie that we have knowingly or unknowingly partnered with. And I believe that this, this passage is giving us the answer here. Because it talks about that first we need to trust. It says, our roots will grow down deep. But we need to trust that we come to this place of trusting him. So I present to you the idea that trusting him is not a feeling. It's an act of our will. We can still feel a feeling of fear or uncertainty, but we can still choose to trust. And that means laying down whatever is hindering us from fully coming into and experiencing his love. And so when we yield that fear or that pain or that experience or that trauma, when we yield it and we lay it down, then we are able to come into a place of trusting him. And when that happens, we're able to come into a place where we can receive and experience the depth of his love. And the end part of this verse I just love, and there's so much here. Um, It says, may you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. So whatever it was you were lacking, whatever power to overcome whatever circumstance you were lacking, the answer is in his love, in this abiding. And um, so I just want to encourage us all today that whatever it's going on in our lives, that, that this is a bit of a road map, I feel like, and maybe will help some of us. So my prayer, Lord God, is that you would just go deep into every part of our hearts, our minds, our souls, that you would search out those broken parts of us, Lord, that still need to be fully yielded to you and to have us invite you into those wounded places. And I know you are good in all things, and you will heal, and you will set those areas free, and you will fill us with your love. And so I invite you, Holy Spirit, to fill us up with your love, to give us a new revelation and a new experience of your love. Just wreck us again, Lord, with your love. Wreck us again with your love, Lord. We invite you to do that today. Amen. I'm going to bounce off that and head into assault myself. Would that be okay? I'm going to bounce off what uh, Stacy was saying. My scripture is Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. It's kind of an interesting verse of scripture. I want to read it to you. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Another translation says it this way. The kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. My observation, my first observation comes out of just taking that in context. Jesus is actually talking to the multitudes about John the Baptist. And he says, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? A a reed shaken in the wind, a a man clothed in soft garments. Those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. This This was written about him. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. So Jesus is acknowledging him as the forerunner, that this is my forerunner. And and then he says something pretty amazing about John. He says, assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. That's pretty amazing. But what he says next is, is is even more interesting. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. 
So just think about that. John de or Jesus declares John is more than a prophet. He was the actual forerunner of the Christ. John the Baptist is the greatest prophet who has ever lived under the old covenant, born of a woman, but, but the least person in the kingdom is greater than him. Jesus is like, it's like he's summing up all of the old covenant, every prophet, and saying John was the greatest of them all. But then he makes this pro profound statement about the new covenant. He says the least person in the kingdom is greater than John. So out of that context comes these interesting words of Jesus. From this context of John being the greatest Old Testament prophet, but even the least person in the kingdom is greater than John. And then he says, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. The kingdom of, of God is forcefully advancing in this dark world. And the least in the kingdom is greater than John. So, so it, it's like under the old covenant, there was just so much that, that you could do. But under the new covenant, and, and uh, Stacy was talking about it, you know, Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to do these things in the kingdom. But see, now we are the body of Christ in the earth. You know, before that, that the Spirit of God was upon Jesus' physical body, but now it's upon his many-membered body, but the commission is the same. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. That hasn't changed. The Spirit of God is upon us, and, and I guess what I'm trying to say is... <laughs> God is calling us to be his sons and his daughters and to demonstrate and to, to serve him in the power of the Spirit of God. And yes, there's a forceful dynamic of the kingdom of God invading this world in darkness being pushed back, lives being transformed, people being rescued. That's all part of it. That the kingdom of light is forcefully advancing the least in the kingdom is greater than John, so step into, step into your greatness. Step into who you are. Whenever you heal the sick, you are engaging the kingdom of darkness, and you're actually doing something that John never did. Well, when you cast a demon out of somebody, you are forcefully engaging the kingdom of darkness. You are breaking through enemy lines and setting captives free. Now see, this verse speaks to me uh, of the tenacity and the diligence we are to walk in. As New Testament believers, we are not to be scared of or afraid of the enemy. If we live like we are called to live, he will be concerned about us. Do you remember when the, the guys tried to cast out the demon, the seven brothers? And they ended up kind of running away naked, stripped. Uh, that didn't go well. And they, they said, when, 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 they, when we said, uh, they, they said, we cast you out in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. And the demon said, you know, Jesus, we know. Woo, do we know. And Paul, we know too. But who the heck are you? See, when, when you are operating like Paul was, when you are operating in the kingdom, they know who you are. They're, they're aware of who you are and the authority and the power that you carry. So the application uh, is to stop living on the defensive and to start living on the offensive. I don't mean be offensive. I mean be offensive. <laughs> like... Like, I'm not talking about running around offending people. I'm saying you're, the, you're, on the, you're, you're a team and you're on the offensive. You don't have to be afraid and live on the defenses of, oh man, what's the devil doing now? Man, he's trying to, forget it. You are light in the midst of darkness. Darkness has no power over light. Darkness actually can only operate where light is not in manifestation. When the light comes, darkness has no choice. It's out of there.
to start, to start living in that place of who we are called to be. Arise and shine. For your light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. Don't, don't, don't even be bothered by that. But the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. When you see darkness around you, don't, don't, don't retreat. Don't be afraid. It's your time. It's your season. You were, you were made for this. The darker it gets around us, the brighter our light shines. Does that make sense? Anybody? Um, so my prayer is this. Lord, show me any areas in my life that I'm not moving forward in, that, that I have somehow succumbed to defensive thinking, that, 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 that I'm not that I'm maybe I'm just trying to hold my ground in an area instead of forcefully advancing. Lord, help me to see clearly who you are because I know that if I can see you accurately, it will help me to see who I am in you. I, I, wanna, I wanna fully lay hold on the kingdom of God and be one of those people that God you're using to forcefully advance your kingdom in the earth. In Jesus' name. Amen. I just feel like we should worship for a minute. Is that okay? Can I have the worship team come? Uh, you've heard a lot of things today. And, and a lot of good stuff. And I don't know about you, but the reason I like to worship is that it's in that time as I turn my focus back on the Lord that he usually solidifies the things in me that he's speaking very specifically to me about. And it's in that time that I can see what he wants to do in my heart and my life as a result. So let's stand together this morning and just take a moment and worship him. Thank you, Lord. I should have given you a little more notice. Sorry about that. Giving everybody the song.
Christ my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. invite prayer teams to come up and be available this morning to pray for people. I'm excited about next Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. Encourage you to grab some invite cards as you head out there. They're on the, on the four-year area. The benediction I want to give you is Psalm 25, verse 14. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him and he will show them his covenant. God bless you saints. Have a great week. See you next Sunday.